who am I and whose am I? Two key questions that everybody needs to ask themselves. The means are the ends. How we choose to act changes who we choose to become. Something you and I have tremendous influence. Don't ever discount how small, how insignificant you are. You can serve the world. Because leadership, my friends, is not about you. Leadership is about something greater than you. If our companies are not influencing the globe, we aren't thinking big enough. Are you with me? You and I can rewrite our legacy starting today from self-serving to serving leadership. Yesterday, to be famous is when a lot of different people know you. To be significant is to make a difference in a lot of people you know. It starts with what transfers from my heart to what I know, and what I know becomes my actions. up and just pat yourself on the back. You guys are troopers. You've made it all the way to this point. And it's been a long conference. It's been good, hasn't it? I want to take you back a number of years, about 19 in fact. Some of you were a figment in your parents' imagination back then. We got some young folks here, which is great. But how many of you remember Y2K? All right, a number of you do. How many of you bought the generator or were selling generators? All right, we got at least one back there. In any case, Y2K was one of those years that we all thought the world was going to end, but there was something happening up in Chicago, Illinois, where I, tend, I happen to live, and some people look at me and say, what were you thinking when you moved to Chicago? But I'm from Canada, and uh, I love the great white north, and we sure love Chicago. We're empty nesters, believe it or not. We have three kids in college, and uh, we are loving it. So you're all welcome to visit us sometime, just not everyone at one time, okay? And you may not want to come when it's cold, like right now. But Dave, you said it was going to be hot down here when I came and I haven't found it yet like that. But how many of you are enjoying Sarasota? It's, yeah, it's at least a great place to be here in the wintertime. In any case, Y2K, big leadership summit in Chicago, a large church up there by the name of Willow Creek holds this once a year summit. And uh, on Y2K, that was the time of Bill Clinton's legacy buster. Okay, does anybody remember the Lewinsky scandal? All right, so right around that time, with the Lewinsky scandal, a pastor was brought in to counsel the president, kind of help him through that whole process. And that pastor also happened to have a summit, a large leadership summit in Chicago, and decided to uh, invite the president to come and join him on the stage at his summit and interview him on leadership. He said, I'm going to take this opportunity, and he did not tell his team about it. He got in trouble with the church world, obviously, because Mr. Clinton was not very popular with the church world and a couple thousand leaders in the room when he brought him in. So it kind of sucked the air out of the room. But he came up on stage and the pastor asked him a number of questions. The first one was, Mr. President, when the American people see you walk into church Sunday after Sunday with a Bible under your arm, they believe you're doing it, especially the evangelicals, are doing it for political show. Would you like to speak to that? Nothing like throwing a hardball at Mr. President right off the bat. And the president said, well, I, you know, I've been in church for the last 30 years. If it's a show, at least it's a consistent show. Great answer, Mr. President. And then uh, the pastor went on to more, you know, safer softball questions like, tell us about your greatest leadership role models, Mr. Clinton. And uh, President Clinton began to talk about Gandhi from India, the great serving leader Gandhi. And then he got off on Mandela from South Africa, and then he began to talk about Kennedy from Massachusetts and Martin Luther King Jr. and all these wonderful leaders that had impacted his life. And all at once, it was time for the president to be whisked off the stage and on to his next assignment. The next speaker up was Ken Blanchard. Now, Ken Blanchard is known for the One Minute Manager. He's kind of the guru of management and leadership here in North America. And he came back to his faith when he was much older and wrote a book called Lead Like Jesus. How many of you have read that book? All right, a number of you have. And uh, basically what Ken says is that everything I've done in life is successful because I have followed the model of leading like Jesus. Everything I have done has been based on the model of Jesus. Now, I found that rather fascinating. So, 
As you think about leadership, we don't typically think about Jesus as a role model to follow. But Ken said, after the president was gone, he said, how many of you believe the president's legacy would be a whole lot different had he mentioned Jesus of Nazareth as his leadership role model instead of Gandhi and Mandela and all these other men? And of course, the whole crowd cheered and clapped, and Blanchard turned right around at them and said, you know what, he's been in church for 30 years, and he's never heard it from you guys. Now, I realize we're a business conference. We're not in church world right now. But a lot of times we relegate Jesus to church world. We don't let him get into business world. And I want to propose to you today that even though we have failed in church world to talk about Jesus on leadership, we would do a whole lot better if we would even bring him into the business world. You know, Jesus is for all time, for all people, in every place, in every environment and situation. Would you not agree with that? And so I want to propose to you in this presentation that Jesus is a role model for serving leadership that we can learn from. And we're going to be building that as we move along. Now, some people think that serving leadership is all about letting the inmates run the prison. Just let people do jolly well what they feel like doing. Make people happy by letting them run the show. That's what serving leadership is. It's not at all that. In fact, as we are going to learn, serving leadership is about casting a vision from the top, then you flip the pyramid and you serve and empower your people to fulfill the mission, the values, the goals of your company. Now, why Jesus? You might ask if Jesus really is a role model, consider his life for a moment. He had 12 guys that he led and one turned out really bad. Why would we study Jesus on leadership? In fact, the church didn't even begin. The enterprise, the organization, the company didn't begin until after he left. Why would we study Jesus? Well, for one thing, he had unparalleled humility. Jim Collins, and you may have read his stellar book a number of years ago, Good to Great. I thought it was one of the best business books I ever read. And uh, he talked about level five leaders who have this incredibly indomitable will, this, this incredible passion to fulfill something. They, they're driven with goals and vision and value. They're incredibly ambitious, but their ambition first and foremost is for the cause, for the organization, for purpose and not for themselves. He said it's a blend of this will and this incredible humility. A level five leader is one who blends both of them, Jim Collins says. And it's a perfect description of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, I'm gonna be taking you through four processes here very, very briefly in introducing this material. We're actually only going to spend time on the first one and only a little bit in the first one, which is beginning the journey. Beginning the journey. Now, beginning the journey is all about leading self. You know, the hardest person to lead, I believe Golden talked about this as well, is leading me, isn't it? I'm the hardest guy to lead in the room. And I need to learn self-leadership before I can begin to lead others leading a team, and leading at an organizational level. Now, everything that I'm going to be sharing with you today is also found in my 4Q program, Serving Leadership 4Q 2020. And uh, I'll be giving you more details about that as we go along. Um, in fact, I'm not even that excited about selling a lot of my program today because I have so many people already signed up for the year. But uh, I have a few spots left if you're interested. You can see me afterward, and uh, we can talk about it. In any case, I don't know if you've ever been frustrated with leadership. I've had a lot of leadership frustration. When I started out leading an organization back in 1997, GTO, Global Tribes Outreach, not the old car that you all remember so well, at least some of you remember. But uh, when I was starting to lead that organization, I remember five people on my first team that were in the room, and they were my friends. They were my friends. But the reality is, sorry. <laughs> Let me get this up here again. The reality is, my friends, you, with them in the room, you could have cut the air in the room with a knife. The tension was so thick. Why? Because I had a wonderful plan for their lives. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Very top-down, very power-driven from you. You're in charge. You've got goal strategies. In fact, I tell my wife and kids this all the time. If you don't have a plan for your life, everybody else has a plan for your life. How many of you know that's true? Right? And so this idea of leading my team very top-down, very, very driven. Uh, I'm an A-type. And I had to learn leadership. I was frustrated because even though they were my friends, I could cut the tension with a knife. 
and they didn't want to always follow me. I could talk to you about my family, the frustrations that I've had leading my family, leading my teenagers. I'll tell you a story a little bit later about my 16-year-old daughter. But I've been frustrated in leadership. Well, I began to meet with a mentor, Dr. Jim Shockey from the Southern Baptist. We went out for breakfast at JJ's every once in a while. He began to teach me about leadership. In fact, he invited me to an encounter called Lead Like Jesus with a bunch of guys from Wycliffe, guys that study uh, language and, and just scary people, okay? Those that have degrees out to Wazoo and know how to speak in multiple languages. But I went to this event and my leadership began to change. In fact, a year later, one of our staff guys said, Luke, you now listen to us. That was interesting. Yeah, thank you. You now listen to us. Now, what's interesting is that it took my family like 15 years to figure that out. Get this clicker working here. Okay, here we go. Um, it took my family 15 years to figure it out. Now, I've got three wonderful children. My oldest daughter is married to uh, a, a young man that we dearly love, Josiah Zimmerman. And uh, we're, so we're an expanded family of six now. But uh, you should be laughing when I say it took them 15 years to figure it out, because it really didn't. It took me 15 years to figure it out. You can fool some of them some of the time. You can't fool all of them all the time. And you certainly can't fool your family any time. How many of you know that's true? <laughs> All right. It took them 15 years until they began to say things like, Dad, you're a serving dad, or my wife would say, you're actually serving. And uh, the reality is you can't microwave leaders either, right? It takes time for you to process. And for me, leadership is a journey. I'll be working on serving leadership for the rest of my life, for the rest of my life. Well, here's an assumption that I want to share with you before I get too far into my material. I believe that everybody in this room either follows Jesus, believes in Jesus, or at least admires Jesus. And based on that assumption, I'm going to speak to you this afternoon. I'm going to talk about Jesus as a leadership role model, and I want to start out with a theology lesson. Now, you probably have never had theology at a business conference until Myron Golden showed up. But he gave me free license to take this a little bit farther, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Are you okay with that? I know we're at the end of a conference. Our minds are like mush. But we're going, to, we're going to do some theology, all right? About five, six years ago, I met a man by the name of Dr. Dennis Kinlaw. Dr. Dennis Kinlaw led Asbury University during the big revivals in the 70s and the 80s. And uh, Dr. Kinlaw took me under his wing in the last few years of his life. The guy was on, on oxygen most of those times when I met him. And uh, I'm the Energizer Bunny, but this guy wore me out in three hours. He would pour into me, pour into me, and one of the most important things that he taught me was what or who God really is. Now, here's something we need to know about, about God. First of all, Voltaire, the great atheist, once said that, that we have remade God in our broken image. See, the, the reality is, folks, that God has made us in His image, and then we repay Him the favor by remaking Him in our own when we don't understand who He is. A.W. Tozer once said that the most important thing about you and I is what comes into our minds when we think about God. It's the most important thing. Everything else will fall on that concept of who God is to us. Now the reality is, is that God is a trinity. We all know this. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. By definition, God is a family. God is all about the other. The Father was all about the Son. Listen to my Son, right? And the Son was all about doing the Father's will. One of the reasons that we're messed up on Jesus today, folks, is because we interpret Him post-resurrection, and we ought to. Savior, Shepherd, Lord. But folks, pre-resurrection, Jesus is modeling to us that leadership is not about us. Jesus was not worshipped and adored. He wasn't a super leader. He was modeling to us a serving leadership mindset. And that, my friends, is the model for us here today, is we are pre-resurrection. All right? Do you understand that? And if we don't understand that, it doesn't make sense when we say lead like Jesus. Because a lot of us go, man, lead like Jesus? Like, I can't be Jesus. He was God. Let me tell you something. Jesus did not come into this world wearing a t-shirt that said, I am. Deal with it. He did not pull out a God card when things got really tough. Are you with me? He limited himself. You and I can actually lead, love, and serve like him. And when Jesus came to the world with extreme humility and incredible, indomitable will to fulfill his Father's will, my friends, he left us an example that leadership is not about us, but it's about something greater than us. 
And whatever we do, whatever business we are involved in, it's not ultimately about us. It's about making the world a better place. You and I join God in the redemptive purposes. We are involved in work. I loved Golden's definition on work. This is phenomenal, this, story, this uh, theology we got from him. So I'm going to build on that just a little bit. See, here's what Kinlaw helped me understand. I had this really ridiculous question. I don't know if you've ever asked the question, why nakedness in the garden? So I have three kids, and we lived in Thailand. Two of them were born there. And I remember getting them out of the bathtub, and they would run through the house stark naked, free as a jaybird, and loving it, and no shame. Anybody have kids normal like mine? And they were little sinners. Now, they were cute little sinners, but they were sinners, right? They grabbed the rails of the playpen, said, I'm the blessed controller around here. Life's about me. Feed me. Take care of me. Change my diaper. It's all about me. Anybody have kids like that? You know what I'm talking about. Self-centered little sinners, cute little sinners, naked little sinners, and no shame. So it didn't make any sense to me when Adam and Eve sinned that they had shame. And so I asked a lot of smart people, I asked my smart brother, I asked another guy by the name of Stan, I said, Stan, I don't get this. And then I asked Dr. Kinlaw, and he said, look, you understand something, before the fall, there was no self-awareness, there was no self-conception, there was no self-ad nauseum, there was no self. Adam and Eve were worshipers. They were completely focused outside of themselves. Now, this is powerful and important, folks, because when you and I were made in the image of God, God is all about the other. The Father is all about the Son, the Son is all about the, fa the, the Father, and the Spirit, when He comes, He will talk about the, the Son, right? About Jesus. And so we've got this entire concept of the Trinity being all about the other. In fact, the very act of creation was an act of others orientation. Are you with me? The very creation of this incredible protected place of pleasure, according to Golden. We were meant for the garden. We were meant to work. We were meant to create. It was an act of others' orientation. And Adam is looking out at the animals, naming them, right? You remember the story? And what happens? Well, he kind of messed up. He gets, you know, hippopotamus. He's got rhinoceros. He's got all these great names. And then, uh, you know, day four or five, he gets down to one-liners, cat, dog, pig. And so God says, we've got to jumpstart Adam. So he brings, well, by day seven or eight, it was just like, whatever they're doing, fly, right? Okay, so we're going, Luke, what Bible do you read? <laughs> it's, it's Kipfer's Revised Living Version, all right? So God creates woman. Wow, man, Adam's impressed. Like, whoa, this is incredible. And then just a little bit later, it's the woman you gave me. What happened? First, Adam is out, focused outside of himself, naming the animals, walking with God in the cool of the day. He's a worshiper. He's excited about this woman that God brings into his life. And then the moment that they bypassed all those other trees and went to that one tree, they focused on lack. What happened? Augustine calls this being curved in on themselves. In fact, that's Augustine's definition of sin. Incurvatus in se is the Latin term. Being curved in on ourselves, folks, that's when sin entered the world. I used to think sin was like rape, theft, murder, all those bad things that we talk about. But it's not. It's being curved in on ourselves. It's the opposite of serving leadership. It's being more about me than anything else. Up until this point, I'm sure Adam and Eve could have pinched themselves and said, yes, I exist. But the reality is they were worshipers. They were attributing value and worth outside of themselves. When you and I do business, we are doing it for the greater good of those that work for us, for the community. We use products and services to make the world a better place. We are serving this world through business. We are serving our people through business. We were made to be worshipers, to attribute value and worth on that outside of ourselves. Now you're gonna look, boy, you're really preaching here. Well, let me dial this back in just a minute, because I want to take you to Romans 1.18 yet, because this is where Kinlaw finished it. He said, Luke, in Romans 1.18, it says that the wrath of God is revealed against all godlessness and unrighteousness. Now, there's two Greek words there. I'm not a Greek guy, but I learned two of them. And one is asebia, and the other is adakia. Godlessness is asebia, and adakia is, uh, uh, sorry, asebia is not worship, not worship. Godlessness, not worship, and adakia is not rightness. And he said to me, Luke, what happens is that when we stop worshiping, we start doing unright things. 
When we stop serving, when we stop valuing things outside of ourselves, we start doing things that are completely contrary to the way we were designed. We were designed to serve. We were designed to make this world a better place. But folks, you and I become curved in on ourselves. That's what original sin is. And what happens? Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the snake. And the snake didn't have a leg to stand on. And we've been saddled with blame ever since. And instead of serving, we become self-serving. Are you with me? I just gave you a theology lesson on, on, on serving leadership, and now we're going to get into the lighter stuff, because our minds are like mush, right? The theology of serving leadership is so important to understand before we get into this, because leadership, my friends, is not about you. Leadership is about something greater than you. Leadership is about making the world a better place. It's about serving our employees, serving our communities. And we're going to get to a, a, to a great statement by, by Robert uh, Greenleaf a little bit later on, the, the grandfather of servant leadership. Servant leadership... Serving leadership. Yes, we are servants, but serving is a verb. We are here to serve a broken world. Leadership is not about us. And this is the one verse that kind of blows my mind. I don't know if you've ever come across verses that kind of just jar your circuits, but this is one of them. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater works than me. Folks, Jesus had this entire concept of empowering his people empowering them to do greater things than him. When you and I are true serving leaders, we are not about our own success. We're about ongoing success after we're gone. A true successful person is somebody who raises up successors. Somebody who builds a business that will outlive them, outlast them. Somebody who builds something that will go on to affect the world long after they are gone. Are you with me? When God's CIA agents show up, will he find your fingerprints all over the world or will he find the fingerprints of his son? and all kinds of people's lives that you impacted through business, through community, through your life. Well, I want to talk, get into my material. If you've downloaded the digital notes, you know where they are, they're at. Um, I want to ask the question, where does serving leadership begin? This is in the notes, if you got the digital copy. Where does serving leadership begin, folks? Where would you say on that chart right now? Does it start with leading an organization, leading a team, leading another person? Leading yourself. Leading myself, that's right. I need to lead myself before I can lead another person lead a team. And so the serving leadership begins with me. It begins with me. I want to take you to a verse in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. I know you're going, Luke, man, this is really a sermon now. But this is one of those verses that just kind of jarred me a number of years ago when I came across it. It says, even though he was a son, he had to learn obedience by what he suffered. Do you think Jesus had to go through a process of leading himself before he could lead others? The scriptures would suggest that. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, even though he was a son, he had to learn obedience by what he suffered. Now, was Jesus ever disobedient? No. But he had to go through a process to refine his values so he could become, and here it is, I want you to write this down, a leader worth following. Because that's what serving leadership is when it comes to self-leadership. Am I a leader worth following? A leader worth following. And this is going to take us now to Matthew chapter 4. We have the three great temptations. And folks, these three great temptations are temptations that every one of us can relate to. Before Jesus went down to the beach and called those guys to follow his first team, he had to go out into the wilderness and clarify his personal values to make him someone worth following. You remember the story. He was led out by the devil for four, not, he, was, he was led by the devil in these temptations. Forty days he had been fasting. He's hungry. And the devil comes to him and says, if you are the Son of God, in fact, every one of the temptations is prefaced with if because it's an identity point. Who am I and whose am I? Two key questions that everybody needs to ask themselves. Who am I and whose am I? Clarifying my personal values makes me someone worth following. Now, this first temptation turns stones into bread. I'm telling you, when I first read that, I'm like, I can't relate to Jesus on his temptations. I've never been so hungry that I've come home and I've been walking up the driveway, kicking the stones, going, man, I wish I could turn them into M&Ms. Has anybody ever been that hungry? No, so I can't relate to that temptation, so I want to go to the next one. But what if there is something deeper for you and I to clarify as leaders here today in leading ourselves? What if this is all about denying instant gratification. Denying what I want in the moment for me so that I can serve a higher purpose. Serving leaders deny instant gratification 
because they live for something greater than themselves. Oh, I could do that. I could use people. I could use the, 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 the business that I've got. I could run over people to accomplish what I want to get done. I could be unethical, right? I could, you know, cheat on my taxes so I can give more to charity. I'm not sure if that even makes sense. All right? But I'm going to do something to gratify my flesh because of the buzz that I get by giving, right? And there's a story of Ananias and Sapphira that doesn't have a good outcome on that. So, folks, let's not go there. Let's go to the second temptation. What's the second temptation? You ever been taken to the top of a, if you're in an agricultural area, okay? How many of you from Pennsylvania? You guys have a lot of silos up there, all right? Have you ever been tempted to go to the top of the highest silo? Or if you live here in the south, to go to the top of a, okay, you've been tempted to go up, but have you been tempted to put your Superman suit on and leap off the silo? Have you ever been tempted to go to the top of the steeple of a local church and leap off with your Superman suit on? Okay, if you have, Dave, do we have any counselors here? Yeah. All right, Dave will become one for you, all right? You're hearing voices. So again, I, I, I hear that temptation. I, I can't relate to that, folks. But what if there's something much deeper here? What if this temptation, now think about it, all the top gun leaders of that day, the Pharisees, Sadducees, all those big guns are all at the bottom. Jesus has come to be a Messiah, right? What better place than for him to announce himself? I am Messiah. I have come. And he leaps off and glides down in front of all those people. Wouldn't that be a great way to announce yourself as a leader? And Jesus said, no, I will not. And here's the lesson for us. Use my God-given talents, gifts, and abilities for my glory, but for his glory. I will not use my business. I will not use my talents on the stage, off the stage, whatever I'm doing as a salesperson, for my glory, but for his glory. This business is about him. It's about making him famous, not me famous. Use your God-given talents for your Father's glory. And you see this over and over and over again. I've not come to do my will, but the one who sent me. And Jesus would sneak away from the applause when they tried to make him a king. You see, Jesus denied instant gratification. And he used his God-given gifts and abilities for his Father's glory to become a leader worth following. A leader worth following. You know, a lot of us, we use our leadership to stoke our ego. And I want to give you a new definition of ego. This comes from Blanchard and Hodges in their book, Lead Like Jesus. A lot of us use our leadership and our authority and power and influence to edge God out of the equation. But Blanchard and Hodges suggest that we, you and I ought to use our ego to exalt God only. Isn't that a great redefinition for ego? To use our leadership, to use our business, to use our serving to exalt God only. There's your new definition for ego. Exalt God only. What was the third temptation? Satan sneaks up to him and says, hey, I'm going to give you all the kingdoms of the world if you bow down and worship me for three seconds. Here's the contract, sign the dotted line, two seconds on your knees, Jesus, and you can have it. I know why you came. You came to bring the kingdom, remember Golden's words, you came to bring the kingdom back to your father, and I'm going to give it to you on a silver platter. It's a good deal. And Jesus could have compromised everything to get what he came for, folks. What's this temptation for you and I? If you and I want to become a leader worth following, we have to deny not only instant gratification, deny using our God-given gifts for our glory, but for His glory, and thirdly, to not take shortcuts to success. You and I are tempted on a daily basis to use our abilities, talents, everything we've been given, all the opportunities we've been given for our glory. The end justifies the means, people say. But do the ends really justify the means? In Seth Godin's words, he says, is it worth lowering your standards and giving up your principles in order to find a better outcome? Godin states this, he says, many times the means are the ends. How we choose to act changes who we choose to become. The way to choose to get to where we're going defines what it's going to be like when we get there. How many of you remember Bernie Evers from WorldCom, or Kenneth Lay from uh, Enron. These guys were incredible, well, I don't know why I'd call them incredible leaders. They had incredible companies, they had incredible influence, 
but they rape their companies, they rape the, uh, the retirement funds of all their people. And what a lot of people don't know about Kenneth Lay and Bernard Ebers is that these guys were both Sunday school teachers. These guys were both supposedly followers of Jesus. Folks, let me ask you, do the ends justify the means? Do you and I become a leader worth following by following Jesus' model or by living by the world's model? Should our Christianity and church translate into business, yes or no? Yes. I think the, the answer is very, very clear. It's not about titles and positions. A lot of times in leadership we think, well, if I just have the title, if I just have the position, then people need to follow me. Um, I've got a slide coming up here in a little bit that I think will make that point quite clearly. Uh, but it's not about our titles and positions. Now, there's nothing wrong with titles and positions, folks, but it's primarily about becoming a leader worth following. And Jesus became a leader worth following at an authority unlike everybody else because he conquered those three temptations. He came out of the desert in the power of the Spirit, went down to the beach, called those guys, and what did they do? They instantly dropped everything, their security. All right, their financial security, they dropped their families, they dropped everything to follow him because he was somebody worth following. It wasn't because he had a title or a position. Your title and your position will only take you so far. But are you a leader worth following? That's the key point when it comes to leading self. Becoming a leader worth following. The second phase is all about one-on-one -on -one leadership. This is where trust is built. You remember the story of Peter walking on water. Now, we always give Peter a hard time because he, he saw the wind and the waves, right? And then he fell down. But the reality is he's the only guy besides Jesus that has walking on water on his resume. Just remember that, okay? And he probably had to walk on water twice to get back to the boat. So don't be so hard on him. But here's the key point. It took tremendous trust for Peter to put one foot out of the boat and into what was known as hell, all right? The Sea of Galilee, if you were a Jewish fisherman back then, you actually didn't know how to swim. You were a fisherman, but you always stayed in the boat. And the maelstrom would come up, the, the winds would start to blow, the storm would come up, and everybody was afraid of losing their lives out in the Sea of Galilee. You never went out in a storm. And Peter steps out into what they conceived as basically hell. He trusted Jesus, and as long as his eyes were on him, there was this incredible connection one-on-one. -on -one. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. Trust is where it all is at. You know this, and I know this. You may have heard of Stephen Covey's book, The Son of the Stephen Covey of the Seven Habits, wrote the book, The Speed of Trust. How many of you have read that book, The Speed of Trust? You need to get that book, folks. It's an incredible game changer. We need to get back to doing business at the speed of trust. We need to get back to where we can trust people and do business on a handshake. How many of you are in on that one? How many of you enjoy all those mindless contracts and stuff you can never even understand and all, all the lawyers have figured it out? We need to get back to being trustworthy, all right? And serving leaders can do that. They can build tremendous levels of trust. The third phase is all about building effective teams. Folks, I want you to look at this one very, very uh, carefully. Um, we all like people like ourselves. We like to hang out with people like us, but it's the worst way to run a business. We don't want to have people around us that are yes people, right? Just do as I say. When I say jump, you say? Oh, hi. You're not going to go very far in business, are you? You need a diverse team. I loved what Golden said about diversity this morning. That was fantastic. We're all part of the human race, and we need to welcome diversity. Jesus did that. He had this guy that was akin to an IRS agent. Remember this guy's name, Matthew, the tax collector? And then he brings in a guy that is a zealot, Simon the Zealot. What do we know about a zealot? Well, the, the zealots had this little sword strapped to their side. It was called a Sakari. Okay? In fact, they were called Sakari. You were a zealot or a Sakari, which meant that you were a modern-day terrorist. You would try to slip up to a Roman centurion in a crowd, whip out your little Sakari, stick them, and then melt back into the crowd. You were there to overthrow Rome, and Matthew was there to build up the coffers of Rome. Can you imagine those two guys? putting their sleeping bags together beside each other at night. Jesus knew how to bring diversity together. He knew how to bring people together that believed in two different things, who would not normally get along with each other and turn them into a lean, mean, teeming machine that would go out and turn the world upside down. How many of you want a lean, mean, teeming machine to turn your company upside down, turn your business world upside down? Yeah. 
You need to do it with diversity. And Jesus gave us a model how to do that. Jesus was a mastermind. The final and fourth phase is what we call organizational leadership. Organizational leadership, achieving effectiveness at a very high level. And this is where Jesus set the disciples up for that success. He went back to the Father and the organization took off because of the DNA that he put into his leaders. Now, how do you achieve that? How do you achieve that? I believe by going deep with the few to impact the many. By going deep with the few to impact the many. How many of you have taken a stone and thrown it out into a pond or a pool of water and you've seen that ripple effect? And that water spread out until the entire shoreline was affected by one tiny stone. Folks, your leadership is limited. But if you and I understand this principle of going deep with the few people that we have impact with, we can impact the world. In your notes, if you downloaded the digital notes, you will see this diagram. Now, these numbers are not arbitrarily chosen, folks. The one represents whom? Jesus, he led himself. And then even in the, in the, among the 12 disciples, which we see as a third number there, he had influenced three out of the 12. Who were they? Peter, James, and John. Pete, Jim, and John, as Maxwell says. And then you've got the 70, the sent out ones, right? Luke chapter 9, he sends out the 12, which is local leadership. He says, go only to the lost tribe of Israel. When you get to Luke chapter 10, he sends out the 70, go to all the towns and villages of the global leadership there, folks. If our companies are not influencing the globe, we aren't thinking big enough. Are you with me? If we're not influencing the greater world and just our local community, we're not thinking big enough. See, some of us are called to scale up around the world. We're called to get into micro-business enterprise to change entire countries around that need the redemptive power of Jesus' model of serving leadership. Are you with me? It needs to be global. And then you see the ripple effect, the 120 at, the, at Pentecost, the 3,000 that were saved on the first day. So then how did we end up at this? A number of years ago, I was traveling in Africa, I was training on serving leadership, I was invited to this church. And in this pastor's office, this is not the pastor, this, the pastor had a three-piece suit on, snakeskin boots, and he was sitting on this throne. I had never seen a throne at a church before until I went to Africa. But friends, I want to tell you, we have a very top-down model that we have exported all over the world. Some churches that I've been in, the seats behind the pulpit are the big ones. When I went to seminary, I was made aware of the fact that the biggest chairs on the stage are for the president, for the dean of the chapel. And as you move away from the pulpit, you get smaller and smaller chairs. So I think we maybe have thrones as well. How did we get to this model of bishops and archbishops and popes? And we've got them even in our environments today. Not a serving leadership mindset, but a king mindset. And, the, and when, I, when we talk about kingdom, folks, we're not talking about kingdom in the terms of what God thinks of kingdom, because again, we have remade God in our broken image. Chuck Colson once said, all the kings I know sent their people out to die for them. I only know one king who went out to die for his people. And I'm not suggesting that you and I... I'm not suggesting that you and I need to go out and die for our people. But we need to flip the pyramid, folks, and become serving leaders. That we genuinely care for the employees, for the communities that we are in. My training partner and I have been traveling now to Africa for a number of years. And we started this organization. It's a nonprofit called the Reverb Network. We go deep with the few to impact the many. In Liberia, Cameroon, and Uganda, we've only trained 50 people, but those 50 have gone on to train over 6,000, and the movement is continuing. Our goal is to start serving leadership movements here in North America and around the world. This is what's going to change the world, folks. We can keep throwing money. Thank you. We can keep throwing money at Band-Aid fixes. We can keep feeding the orphan and the widow, and we ought to. We ought to be doing all kinds of great ministries in this world. But folks, I believe that we ought to go to the root of the problem. Yeah. Are you with me? We ought to be training leaders so none of this ridiculousness continues on. All this craziness where people get into power, and what do they do? They keep their people in poverty. We've got to change that, and we have to do that by raising up serving leaders. It's all about influence. It's all about influence. When I was around 10 years old, 
influence of that reverberating effect. You and I, when we go deep with ourselves, we can influence others. When I was around 10 years of age, we had a, a very tall man in our home. He was from Germany. My dad was with Voice of the Martyrs until he passed away. He was on the Canadian board. And so we had a lot of interesting people, including Richard Wormbrandt, in our home. And I was influenced by all these people who came through our home. And one of them was this really tall guy from Germany. Does anybody know his name, just off, off the top? Hans. They're all Hans from Germany. Okay, I, I'm German, so I can pick on my own people. And this tall man from Germany, as we boys were scampering off the bed, he yells up the step and he says, Boys! I want you to turn to Psalm 119, memorize verses. It gets a little scary when you say memorize 119, right? That's the longest chapter in the Bible. But then he said verses 9 and 10, and never forget them. And as a young man, I did that. And those verses have been my guiding point all through my life. Hans had no idea what kind of influence he would have, the ripple effect that he would have by pointing me to those verses at age 10. Folks, you and I have moments of influence. We've had people who have influenced us throughout our lives. And so I want you to turn to your neighbor right now and just identify one person that had a tremendous influence in your life. I want you to, to, to say that person to the person right beside you right now. Probably many of you have mentioned maybe your mom or your dad, an uncle, a teacher. The next thing I want you to do, I want you to send a text message, get on a phone call before the night is out. And I want you to tell that person how much they influenced you. I want you to thank them. I did this a number of years ago, back in the days of snail mail. Does anybody remember snail mail? And I began to write letters to all the people who had influenced me, had impacted my life. One of those was Gene Erb, my grade six vacation Bible school teacher who believed in me. Somebody who in the choir, by the way. <laughs> Anybody ever sing in a choir? I was a baritone, which means barely a tone. <laughs> okay, I'm not high enough for tenor, not low enough for bass. They give me about three, four notes every four songs, right? And Gene goes to the director and says, Luke, the baritone needs one of my speaking parts. Now, this gal could bring it. She was the orator of the choir. She had ethos and pathos and all kinds of aws in her voice. She could reduce the crowd to tears. And she said, I think Luke needs my speaking point, part. Now, folks, I was not a speaker. But Jean helped encourage me. She believes in me. To this day, Jean is one of my greatest cheerleaders. She has influenced me. And she's just a regular house mom. And she is leading the world. Folks, I want to tell you something. You and I have tremendous influence. Don't ever discount how small, how insignificant you are. You can serve the world by going deep with the few to impact the many. How many of you know that if somebody has to tell you that they are your boss, they're probably not a very good boss? How many of you know that real leadership is based on how hard people work when you're out of the room is when you're in the room? Or how much your kids uh, respect you when you're at home or when you're not at home? Are they throwing crazy parties when you're gone? That depends on whether or not you're a leader worth following. Leadership is not primarily about positions and titles. It's about influence. And no one has influenced the world more than Jesus has he had no position, power, or authority, and yet he had all power and authority. A serving leader is someone worth following who accomplishes a higher purpose by developing others. That's our definition for serving leadership. Somebody who's worth following who accomplishes a higher purpose by developing others. Folks, this is all about the pyramid. Yes, the pyramid ought to be top down. We ought to be leading from the top with direction and vision. But then what do we do? We have to flip the pyramid. We have to flip it upside down and serve our people. That's what serving leadership is. It's not letting the inmates run the prison. It's giving clear vision and direction from the top, then flipping it, and from the bottom we begin to serve. And we say, what can we do for you? How can we help you? How can we, we resource and empower you to accomplish the mission that we gave you from the top? Now, folks, I have only worked through the first quarter of my coaching program. Would you like to hear some more before I sit down? Yes. All right, then we'll keep moving on. We'll keep moving on. 
The last three quarters of my coaching program, either the coaching calls or when I come and visit your company, we talk about three different aspects of serving leadership, the heart, the head, the hands. The heart is where it all begins, folks. If you are using serving leadership uh, uh, techniques to manipulate your people, that's all it is. It's just a manipulation technique. If you don't get the heart right, you don't get anything right. Everything begins with the motives in the heart. And what do we know about people, about work, about leadership? We talk about that in the third quarter. And then finally in the fourth quarter, we talk about um, what does it mean to actually do leadership? How do we actually train, develop people? The doing, the hands of serving leadership. Let's go back to the heart just briefly. At the heart level, we are really asking two questions. Who is my audience? Are people my audience or is... God, my audience of one. Who is my, my audience? If people are my audience, what do I tend to do? Who am I truly trying to please with my leadership? If people are my audience, guess what happens? I lead out of either pride or fear. Pride that says, I'm the blessed controller around here. I make all the decisions. I've got all the answers. And what happens when I lead out of pride or I lead out of fear? Well, pride always leads to self-exaltation and self-promotion. And none of us like following leaders like that. But when people are our audience, we either lead out of pride or we lead out of fear. Fear is where most of us probably struggle with. I make decisions because I want to make keep people happy. I don't want to offend anybody, all right? And so we then have what we would call self-protection. I try to protect myself and I will do all kinds of crazy stuff to make myself look good and protect my, myself as a leader. And our ultimate audience is people. But folks, when God is my audience of one, I can lay my head on the pillow at night and say, God, did I honor you? Did I serve you by serving others? God, did I make a decision that pleased you? And it doesn't matter what people think of me. When God is your audience of one, you are led by incredible humility because it's not about you, and you are led by tremendous courage because if he is for you, who can be uh, against you? Folks, when God is your audience of one, it changes everything. Our ultimate audience ought to be God, our audience of one. And again, we get to the ego factor. If you didn't pick that up before, we can either edge God out by pride and fear, or we can exalt God only through humility and courage. How many of you remember Jim Collins? I talked about him a little bit earlier. He gives this incredible picture of leadership, self-serving or serving leaders. And he talks about the window and the mirror. He says that serving leaders look in the mirror when things are going bad and say, the buck stops with you. You messed up. You didn't resource your people. You didn't train them well enough. It's your fault that they are not doing well in their work. And you look out the window when things are going really well and you say, look what my team did. That's a serving leader. Greater works you will do, Jesus said. He believed in his team. But what do self-serving leaders do? They look in the mirror and say, wow, look at me, I'm incredible. Look what I've accomplished, look what I've done. And they look out the window to blame their people when things are not going well. Serving leaders or self-serving leaders, which one are you? Do you look in the mirror to self-congratulate or do you look in the mirror to take responsibility? Jim Collins on the mirror and the window. Looking out the window, looking out the, uh, looking out the window or looking in the mirror. The third quarter focus is all about knowing, the knowing of serving leadership. I'm not going to say a whole lot on this one, folks. All I want to do here is give you a resource. And uh, this is my purpose statement template. If you're interested, um, you can go to uh, the short code on your browser, uh, lukek.me forward slash PST. Is that all on the screen? Yes, it is. PST, purpose statement template. You can download that. It's got a couple uh, videos. It's a, it's a free online course on developing your purpose statement, your mission statement. This is where we understand who, what we know, what we believe, and uh, will help you guide you through your values, through your goals, the long term, short term, setting those in, 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 in areas of your life. Um, one other thing I'm going to share on this one is an easy way to do your mission statement is to actually uh, write your obituary. Write your obituary. Have you ever heard of this guy named Alfred who got up one morning? Let me tell you his story just very, very quickly. 
And uh, I think you've heard of him, but you may not know him right now. You may not recognize his picture. But this guy's name was Alfred, and one morning he got up, and he went out to get the paper to settle down and drink his coffee uh, because his brother had just passed away, and he wanted to know what the obituary column would say about his brother. And as he opened up the paper to his dismay and horror and shock, he realized they had gotten the wrong guy. They hadn't got his brother, they had gotten him, and his obituary was a headline of the newspaper. The merchant of death is dead. You see, Alfred was the inventor of dynamite. And he was famous for having designed a device that would destroy the world through war. And what Alfred decided to do when he realized that he would be remembered for death and destruction was to change his entire legacy and rewrite his obituary before he passed away. Folks, you and I know him today as Alfred Nobel, the guy that started the Nobel Peace Prize. You and I can rewrite our legacy starting today from self-serving to serving leadership. You and I can do what Alfred Nobel did. The fourth quarter focus is all about the doing of serving leadership, serving the greater good of humanity. The products and services that you and I are designing and offering the world, folks, are to make the world a better place. A better place. Robert K. Greenleaf, the founder of the modern servant leadership movement and the Greenleaf Center for Servant Leadership, he had this to say. What is the privilege on the least, what is the effect on the least privileged in society? He said, will they benefit or at least not be further deprived? What is the benefit that you and I are having through our business, through our work as, as, as leaders today? Who is, what kind of effect are we having on the world around us? Will they benefit or at least not be further deprived? You and I were designed to make the world a better place, a better place. And so while we wrap this up, I want to give you one opportunity. Before you walk out of here, I want you to write down in your notes. And then I want, to sh I want you to share that with either a spouse or an accountability partner before you leave this place. I want you to share one thing that's going to change about your leadership or about your business to make the world a better place. I want you to take one big takeaway from here and say, this is what's going to change. Because here's what happens so many times in life, folks. We come to, to events like this. We go to church. We meet somebody who just knocked it out of the park and go, wow, that was incredible. I was challenged. I've got people coming up to me all the time saying, look, that really challenged me. I'm so tired of hearing that. Aren't you, Dave, when people say, that challenged me? Because, folks, really what matters is what changed in me. What am I leaving with that's going to be different as a result of this conference? And how can I use what I've learned to make the world a better place? Because I was put here. I was designed to serve. So would you just take a minute and write that down? And I'm going to fish a quote out of my pocket that I wrote down yesterday that was so incredible. And I'm going to share that right after you are finished writing that one thing down. And remember, you're going to share it with one other person to keep you accountable. How you are going to change the world. How you are going to serve your spouse, your wife, your kids. Go ahead, write it down. And then I'm going to wrap this up. If you are interested in my coaching program, I've got a few spots left for this year. You can see me at my table afterward back in the corner. And I will be happy to, uh, to talk to you about that. Again, I'm not going to promote that from the stage. I know you've had a lot of selling going on, and you're probably kind of overwhelmed with all the amount of products and great coaching programs. So um, I'm not going to say a lot about that. Here's a quote that I wrote down yesterday. To be famous is when a lot of different people know you. To be significant is to make a difference in a lot of people you know. Dave Kaufman. Let me read that one more time. To be famous is when a lot of different people know you. To be significant is to make a difference in a lot of people you know. Would you give Dave Kaufman a hand for that, folks? Now, I told you I was going to tell a story about my daughter, 16-year-old Brittany. We are best friends today, but at age 16, she stormed away from the table. She said, Dad, you are such a jerk. 
And I was. I wasn't exactly a serving leader. I have failed over and over again. Now, while this has become my signature material in my life, this is my passion of serving leadership. I'm running around the world these days training serving leaders. I was not doing a very good job with my 16-year-old daughter. And I realized that I needed to win her heart back. And for the next few years, I began to travel with her. I took her to Egypt, took her to Africa, took her down to Atlanta to a, to a large worship conference. We began to spend time together. And that little girl came back. <laughs> Leadership is hard work. If I fail with my family, I failed with everyone. Last year she got married. She said, Dad, before I get married, I want to do a trip with you. So we went out to the West Coast. We had the time of our lives together. She calls me up. We have this incredible relationship today because of what Jesus has done in my life in changing my heart to be a serving leader. It begins in the heart. It starts with what transfers from my heart to what I know, and what I know becomes my actions. So I want to close with a story, and I forgot to tell you, I also have a devotional. If you're interested, you come back and pick up my devotional. And if you also want to get on my uh, blog list, I do send emails out, and uh, you can subscribe to that with that link. Folks, I am sorry. I am about out of time, but I want to tell you one more story. Do I have permission to do that? Real quick. All right. A shift in behavior, behavior is what brings about change. It begins in the heart, transfers to the mind, and comes out in our actions. We need to leave a legacy. And so I want to tell you a story from Tony Campolo, who wrote a book called Who Switched the Price Tags. This is probably 30, 40 years ago he wrote this book. And he talked about a black Baptist preacher who said to a group of college kids one day, children, you're going to die. One of these days they're going to take you out, put, the six feet, put you six feet under, throw some dirt on your face, go back to the church and eat potato salad. I don't know why we eat potato salad at our funerals, but we do. He said, when you were born, everybody was a laughing and you were a crying. He said, now when you are dead and gone, will everybody be a crying and you be a laughing? And he said, that depends on whether you live for titles trophies or testimonies. Titles, trophies, or testimonies. If your leadership is self-serving, you are winning titles and trophies in this world today. And the world can look at you and can write off how amazing you were during your life. But folks, if you are living for testimonies, you will leave a legacy that will reverberate into the future. I would like you to put your hands together and give Jesus a round of applause for a model of serving leadership. <laughs>